Greetings from the campus of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. I'm Susie Quintana with the Teleconference Network of Texas and today's program moderator. Welcome to the Redis and Axion research training on breast cancer. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We do want to keep this very informal, so you have a couple of options. Um, you can type any questions or comments into your webinar control panel. Uh, or you can raise your virtual hand and I will unmute you and you can go ahead and dialogue directly with our speakers. Uh, at any point, at any time, anyone is having any problems with the connection or any audio, feel free to send me a message to the chat box so I can address it immediately. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sandra. Thank you, Susie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Redes en Acción Research Training on Breast Cancer. First of all, I'd like to welcome each of you and thank Dr. Alfredo Santillan Gomez from the Cancer Therapy and Research Center for kindly accepting to give this presentation to train our national patient navigators and research staff in Miami, Austin, and San Antonio. Just to give you a brief background, this research project was made possible through an NCI grant that was awarded to Redis and Acción, the National Latina Research Network. We are honored to be collaborating with Dr. Santillan, as well as with our other partners in Miami, as well as in Austin through Livestrong. The purpose of this training is for Dr. Santillan to give you a general overview on breast cancer, as you will be working with breast cancer survivors providing patient navigation services. So without much further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Alfredo Santillan Gomez, and we're going to get started. Thank you very much, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, go yes. ahead and uh, select the uh, clean screen option, and we'll be ready to go. It says show, show my screen. That's what you want me to do? Yes, sir. OK. Excellent. You're good to go. You're good to go. Well, thank you very much. I want to try to give a, in I don't know how many minutes, but in less than an hour, a, a quick overview of uh, breast cancer management. Uh, it's going to be very simple. Breast cancer indeed is very complicated and every year the treatment and the surveillance of these patients gets more and more complicated. First we need to know uh, how important it is to study breast cancer and why it's important to do research. It is a probably the most, it is the most common cancer in women in the United States with more than 240,000 new patients that were diagnosed in 2010. Every three minutes, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, and almost every 12 minutes, breast cancer claims one life. So it's also one of the most common causes of death when it comes to uh, cancer causes. 70% um, of breast cancer cases occur in women who have no risk factors. That means that, that we cannot pinpoint exactly why the patients have breast cancer. This graph uh, shows at the top the incident rate. Um, we can see that in 2010, 182 patients will have breast cancer. And in 2010, 71,000 patients will die. Uh, as we can see, uh, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women and is the second most common uh, cancer that will kill uh, women in the United States. Uh, one of the common questions that I get in clinic is that patients ask, why do I have breast cancer? And in reality is that uh, nothing seems to explain why patients get it. Uh, it's not that they have done something wrong in their life and the patient asks this a lot. So uh, patient navigators need to know about this because patients, when they get diagnosed, they ask a lot about why me, why this. And uh, they didn't catch breast cancer. It's not a virus. It's not an infection. It's not caused by stress or injury to the breast. And the fact is that the majority of women do not have any known risk factors or history of cancer in their families. We're talking about more than 80%. There are going to be a few patients that will have some family history of cancer or they have some risk factors like hormone replacement therapy. One of the most important things when it comes to the management of breast cancer that we need to know is that not all breast cancers come the same. Some are diagnosed very early stage, and some diagnosed in a late stage. So we need to know the breast cancer staging very good to understand what the patient is going to go through. For instance, if we have a patient that by just physical exam comes with a 10 centimeter mass, 
which we get to see very often in Hispanic populations, we know that patients are going to go through surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. At least we know that by the size, patients are going to get at least those three therapies. Depending on pathology, hormonal therapy will be indicated. So the physical exam tells a lot. So we need to know about breast cancer staging very well if we want to talk about breast cancer. Other things that we need to know is about the initial imaging, how is this work up, how patients present to the clinic because they have a mass and then they undergo a mammogram, ultrasound, or eventually MRI. Or this was a screening mammography the patient presented with a calcification. And also we need to know about the nodal status because uh, prognosis and therapy is also guided by the presence of lymph node metastasis. This is just a quick example of how uh, patients sometimes uh, present in clinic. We see here on the, on the bottom how this is what we call the locally advanced breast cancer. This is a patient, if you see the arrow uh, on, the, on the bottom, this is a, a patient who pretty much neglected breast cancer. It's, 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 the tumor has been there for years, and maybe for some reason now uh, she decided to present it to the primary care physician. On the right bottom, we see a rash. This is what we call inflammatory breast cancer, a very aggressive type of breast cancer. Then we see on the top, sometimes we see this dimple of the skin. Um, so physical exam tells us a lot about how advanced the cancer is, and it's very important to, to have this in mind when we see the patients for the first time. Then we move to mammograms. The majority of patients will present uh, for a screening mammogram, and patients will present with uh, calcifications. This is a mammogram that shows calcifications here in this area, calcifications also in this area. And uh, also mammogram, you can see on the top, on this LMLO view, we see a lot of lymph nodes look like grapes. All those are lymph nodes with cancer. And some of these patients will not uh, go to the primary care physician uh, complaining of lymphadenopathy. This is picked up on a routine mammogram. Uh, after, ma after mammogram, the uh, other diagnostic imaging that is very, very commonly done is a breast ultrasound. Breast ultrasound, its key factor is not used for screening. So a breast ultrasound is done when the patient presents to the clinic with a, a palpable mass or that by mammogram there's something abnormal. So we don't use it for screening. We use it for diagnos diagnosis. And here I just give you an example from the left, a simple cyst, how it looks. Uh, the, the, the classic radiological uh, characteristics, uh, anechoic, uh, well circumscribed with a thin wall. And then we move on to a fibrinoma, which we see this solid hypoechoic oval mass, very circumscribed with smooth borders, which represent benign findings. Then we have carcinoma in situ. We see some calcifications in the mass, very regular, taller than white, um, irregular shaped. So this patient has carcinoma in situ with maybe an invasive component. And finally, we have the invasive cancer, which is very regular, taller than white, um, very uh, pos with posterior shadowing, um, <clears throat> with angular ill-defined margins. So ultrasound is very important to when, uh, for diagnosis, but also for uh, to obtain a biopsy. Uh, once in a while, you will see MRI. MRI is not done routinely. This is American Society of Breast Surgeons' statement about when to use MRI on patients with known uh, cancer. This is not for screening. So uh, it will be those with unknown primary with active metastasis. What that means is the patient presents to a lymph node in the axilla that's proven uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma, most likely breast. But by mammogram, by physical exam, by ultrasound, there is no lesion. Then we will get an MRI of the breast. Also, uh, when we have dense breast tissues, which is defined not by physical exam, but is defined by mammogram, and also sometimes in lobular cancers when we want to know the extent of the cancer, uh, lobular carcinoma it tends to be more, um, uh, uh, more extensive, and sometimes mammograms will not tell us exactly the size. Uh, I use it very often. I, I will say in all my patients who undergo new adjuvant chemotherapy, and we'll talk about what is new adjuvant chemotherapy. That means the patients who present with locally advanced breast cancers, that the first step is chemotherapy and then surgery. That's what we call neoadjuvant compared to adjuvant. Um, also, sometimes we use it for BRCA. Those patients have a germline mutation uh, for a uh, gene that will develop breast cancer in the future. And high-risk patients that don't want to go through mastectomy, we can use it for screening. And also, we use it in patients who, by imaging, by mammogram and ultrasound, we're not so clear what they are, 
Sometimes the biopsy shows also is not very helpful. We'll get an MRI on this patient. This is an example of a patient with uh, uh, MRI on, on your right screen. You can see what's in red, green, and blue is uh, the cancer. We can see it's a very extensive cancer. It's at least 10 centimeters in size. The decision is made that this is a local advanced risk cancer. The patient will benefit of systemic chemotherapy rather than surgery at that time. And then we uh, perform an MRI post-chemotherapy, and we can see how the lesion uh, completely disappeared. This patient had a complete clin clinical response. That means that we cannot fill the tumor anymore. And after I do surgery, there's no tumor viable. So also the patient had a complete pathologic response. This is a good example. Another example of a lobular carcinoma. Uh, this is a patient with a 3 centimeter on the left breast by ultrasound and mammogram. Because it's lobular, I always get a, an MRI. And we can see that by MRI, there are satellite lesions. This is a lesion that is more uh, extensive, at least 10 centimeters in size. And therefore, uh, uh, the management of uh, surgical management changes completely from a partial mastectomy to a mastectomy or to start new adjuvant chemotherapy. Another example that I used it is to rule out chest wall invasion. And here we can see on the right, we can see the tumor where the yellow arrow is very close to the pectoralis major. And we can see it here on this, on this part too. And patient, uh, here the MRI shows no invasion of the pectoralis major. Therefore, I was able to do a skin sparing mastectomy with immediate reconstruction in this patient. This is a patient of mine that also presented with lymphadenopathy. You can see that this was diagnosed by mammogram. The patient underwent a screening mammogram, and it only showed a abnormal uh, axillary uh, <clears throat> lymph node. Uh, mammogram didn't show any breast lesions or ultrasound uh, lesions. So MRI showed a breast cancer with, um, here on the MRI. So these are just a few examples of uh, when to use the MRI. You are not going to see MRI very often, except for these indications that I just mentioned, or if the patient is part of a clinical trial that MRI is involved. How do we make the diagnosis? Uh, we don't do surgery for diagnosis. I rarely will do a uh, diagnosis through surgery. Most of the time, this is done through a core biopsy with a clip placement under image guidance. And this is mainly done by mammography radiologists uh, or ultrasound radiologists. Um, there are only a few exceptions where I will do an excisional biopsy, also called needle localization partial mastectomy. When uh, these, uh, for instance, calcifications or the lesion is very close to the chest wall and it's very difficult to do it on the stereotactic core biopsy, when there's atypia on the core biopsy, or when the, by imaging, by ultrasound or mammogram, it appears like a cancer, but when the core biopsy came back as benign, there's something going on, there's no, uh, there's something discordant between the imaging and the biopsy, then I, I'll do an excisional biopsy. But most of these patients will not undergo an excisional biopsy. <clears throat> Here on the top we see a, uh, ultra, all the ultrasound of a uh, breast lesion. We see the classic breast cancer lesion, taller than white. And we see here on the bottom, if you, if you follow my, my, my pointer, we see this white line which represents the core biopsy. This is done in the clinic. This is not under general anesthesia. This is just with local anesthesia. And uh, the patients follow up most of the time a, a few days after with the results of the pathology. So most of these, what, I just, what I, would, I just show you, this is before they come to see the surgeon, before they go see the radiation oncologist, before they go see the medical oncologist. This happened. Uh, at the level of the primary care physician. This happens at the level of the uh, imaging center. Now that we have a, a diagnosis, that's when the patients come to us. This is also a patient with a stereotactic core biopsy, mainly does, done by imaging. Here we see those calcifications and the specimen that confirmed the area of concern. <coughs> at the end, you see the arrow is pointing for a clip, and that's how we monitor uh, or the area where the biopsy was done, we, they, the radiologists always leave a clip. So we do take the patient back to surgery, x-ray is done to prove that the biopsy of concern has been removed. The, uh, if for some reason the ultrasound cannot be done, ultrasound uh, core biopsy or the stereotactic core biopsy with mammogram, there's also the, always the option of an MRI guided core biopsy. And as you can see here, the lesion and the needle is done. So this is done prior to we get to see them. And now we have a pathology. So we cannot give chemotherapy. We cannot give radiation. We cannot do surgery. 
uh, related to cancer unless we have a diagnosis. And the most common uh, his, uh, histologies or breast cancer types, probably the most common of all, is invasive ductal uh, carcinoma, also IDC. Then we have ductal carcinoma in situ. And then around 10% we have invasive lobular carcinoma and a micropapillary carcinoma. This, there are others. There's medullary mucinous, but I will say the most common of all will be invasive ductal carcinoma, DCIS, and lobular carcinoma. Once we have a histologic diagnosis of a breast cancer, there are three prognostic factors that we have to have to make decisions. And this is mainly for the medical oncologist. And um, this is the ERPR status, estrogen and progesterone status, the HER2 new status, and the K67 proliferation index. Based on these receptor status, mainly ERPR and HER2, a lot of decision making is done. It is very important that when we get a pathology report, we need to get the receptor status prior to making any decision. Um, how cancer grows and spreads and spread is a, a very a, a good example between DCIS and, and invasive cancer. This is a breast. Uh, we see some of the parts. We see the muscle. We see the ribs. We see the fatty tissue and the lobules. And then we see the ducts here, very nice ducts. And then we move on to carcinoma in situ. We see all these cells multiply, all, but all within the duct. There is no potential of, or very low potential, in theory, it should be zero, potential of these cells to go through the membrane, um, basal membrane, and invade through the lymphatics or the blood vessels to make the, uh, a metastatic disease. That's what the majority of the times with the cancer is in situ. It's uh, above 95% of the time is curable. And then we have an invasive component here on the last graph. We see how the cells are going through the base membrane. They're coming out. And that's how they get to the nearby lymphatics and nearby blood vessels. Now, when it comes to breast cancer, we have learned in the last 10 years that not all breast cancers are the same. And you need to know this because patients come to me and they say, why am I going through chemotherapy if my neighbor or my sister didn't have chemotherapy? Or why I am not going through hormonal therapy? Or why I'm not going through so-and-so treatments? Because not all breast cancers are the same. Breast cancer is heterogeneous. And just like we do a fingerprint of, um, of our hands and know that everybody's different, we did, uh, scientists did 10 years ago, a fingerprint of the tumors through gene expression profiling. And what they found by mRNA is that not all breast cancers are the same. And there are at least five types of breast cancer, luminal A, luminal B, uh, HER2 positive, basal type, and normal breast-like. So we have now the capabilities to tell the patient exactly what type of breast cancer they have. And based on that, we make the decision making about treatment. But most importantly, we, make this, uh, we explain the patients uh, have a better idea about their prognosis and what to expect. So the breast cancer subtypes, the most common is luminal A. These patients are mainly HER2 negative, ER positive with a low proliferation index. This is the most common subtype. It's very less aggressive. It may represent 60 to 70% of all the breast cancers. Uh, they are hormone responsive. Um, age more than 40 years, a risk factor. We get to see this patient mainly at age 50 to 70. Um, so this is the most common type of breast cancer. If we have a patient, HER2 negative, ER positive, with a low proliferation index, we know that they're going to do very good, a good uh, prognosis, and this can change chemotherapy. We have luminal B, which is very similar, HER2 negative, ER positive, but they have a, a high K67. They have a poor differentiation. These patients still do well. It's less aggressive, uh, have good prognosis, and they're also hormone responsive. Then we move on to what we see more in Hispanics and African American, which is the basal-like, uh, which represents maybe 80% of what we call triple negatives. And that would be HER2 negative, ER negative uh, tumors. And these patients have very aggressive subtype, very high grade histology, high mitotic rate. Their risk factor is mainly an age less than 40. So we see it very common in my patients, Hispanic, that come in their age 30s. And even 40s, we see a lot of triple, of triple negatives with basal-like type of breast cancer. They have the worse survival than the luminal type A and B, but better than the HER2 type. So we know that if we have a patient with that triple negative, therapy is going to be different. Most likely, chemotherapy will be indicated. And also, we know the prognosis may not be as good. 
Um, and then we have HER2, which is also more prevalent in Hispanic population and African American. This can be ER positive or ER negative. Um, this is uh, less common to see, maybe less than 10% of all breast cancers. It's probably the most aggressive of all with the poorest survival of all subtypes, very highly to, to have metastatic disease within the first two years of diagnosis. So once we have the diagnosis, pathology, and a better idea what type of cancer, the, the question comes, do we need to do any pre-op staging for distant disease? And in reality, the answer is no. We don't do it in all of them. We have to be very selective. This scan shows a PET scan with multiple metastatic disease to the bone, to the axilla, to the liver, and, re and retroperitoneum. But when we'll do a pre-op staging, and it's mainly with CT scan, we'll be patient with a positive uh, lymph node in the axilla proven metastatic disease. Those patients who have recurrent tumors, some patients with new adjuvant chemotherapy, and those patients who have symptoms of possible metastatic disease, uh, uh, bone pain would be one of those. When to give new adjuvant chemotherapy? So new adjuvant chemotherapy plays a, a role. It means chemotherapy given prior to surgery. And there are a few advantages. First of all, there's no difference in survival if you give chemotherapy prior or after to chemotherapy. That is well-known randomized trial. So then why will you use it? Uh, our potential advantages to tumor downsizing. So we have a tumor that looks like this, locally advanced, infected, a fungated mass. To do a mastectomy may be more difficult. Uh, it, will, it, will, it may cause an infection. You may have to take more of the breast and maybe the muscle. So we want to give chemotherapy to shrink the tumor and make something that is uh, uh, more difficult to operate, simpler to operate. And also we'll do it if a patient is interested in having a lumpectomy rather than a mastectomy given the tumor size. So you have a four centimeter, five centimeter tumor that you can give chemotherapy and shrink it so the patient can go partial mastectomy, that would be another indication. There are other potential advantages. Uh, that would be an in vivo assessment of tumor response. In other words, you give the chemotherapy and you see if the chemotherapy is working or not. You see the tumor shrinking or not. If you see the tumor is not uh, uh, shrinking uh, or growing, you know you have to change your chemotherapy or take the patient to surgery. Um, and there's a, a, another potential advantage that is you're treating now the patient completely rather than giving just local therapy like surgery, you're giving systemic therapy. That will be some of the indications for new adjuvant chemotherapy. The decisions making is mainly who will be those patients, T3, T4, that means more than five centimeters tumors invading the skin, N2 disease means fixed nodal disease in the axilla, maybe the age of patient, usually younger the patients will decide to new adjuvant chemotherapy to downsize tumor for surgery, that means the patient's interested in partial mastectomy, and also histology and receptor status. If you have a low proliferation index, ERPR positive, luminal A tumor, you know the chemotherapy is not going to touch the patient. But if it is a ERPR positive, you can do new adjuvant hormonal therapy with these patients. So now well, let's move on to how do we treat breast cancer overall if we're not going to do new adjuvant chemotherapy. The answer is in a multidisciplinary approach with experts in the management of breast cancer. Ideally, patients are treated in a cancer center where all the physicians are in the same place. You have a radiation oncologist that deals with breast cancer, chemotherapy, and hormonal therapy. And surgery, as you can see, plays uh, an important role. Most patients, I would say almost all patients, will undergo surgery. And I believe that surgeons should be the first to see the patient. Then consultations are done to radiation oncology, chemotherapy, and hormonal therapy, depending on the uh, treatments that will be done based on the tumor size and histology. Uh, very basically, radiation therapy, as we can see here, is local therapy. Radiation therapy it does not cause the hair to fall. That's a very common question patients ask. It's like surgery. These are local regional therapy. Chemotherapy is given through the veins, through the port, and that is systemic therapy. This is the one that will have side effects, including the uh, hair loss. And hormonal therapy, it's a pill, um, very well known, tamoxifen, arimidex, and others. These are given for ERPR positive patients for uh, five years, and this is usually given as the last treatment when the radiation surgery chemotherapy is done, hormonal therapy is given on ERPR positive patients. When it comes to surgery, every patient uh, that has no palpable disease goes into central lymph node biopsy, in which we inject blue dye and technetium 99, and uh, usually I sue from blue dye, and we map these lymph nodes in the axilla and we sample that one when they're in the operating room 
and if there's evidence of metastatic disease, then we remove the rest of the lymph nodes. If there is no evidence of metastatic disease, then uh, we left the rest of the lymph nodes. This, this is standard of care. Um, patients have a lower risk of uh, uh, lymphedema with less morbidity, less infection, and um, this is what we do uh, now very often in patients with clinically occult um, metastatic disease to the axilla. When it comes to types of surgery, breast conservation surgery involves to, to mainly to preserve the nipple areola complex and to preserve uh, uh, at least most of the breast. And when we do, this is also known as lumpectomy, and the proper name is partial mastectomy. Uh, we, we have to do this, if we do breast conservation surgery, we have to involve radiation therapy. Uh, the, uh, to not do radiation therapy, we run into the risk of a high uh, local regional uh, uh, failure, and that's with radiation therapy. So every time you're going to see a patient with partial mastectomy, you know that patient's going to go through radiation, so you have to set up all the consultations needed for radiation oncologists to be seen prior to surgery. There are usually two separate incisions, one in the breast and one for the axilla of the central lymph node. So breast conservation surgery involves partial mastectomy and some form of radiation therapy. The other surgical management will be a mastectomy. And mastectomy is surgery to remove the breast with the nipple areola complex. Now, when you do a mastectomy, radiation therapy is almost always omitted. There will be certain, uh, some indications to give radiation post-mastectomy, and that will be on tumors more than 5 centimeters or patients who have uh, more than two or three lymph nodes with metastatic disease. But overall, you can be very confident if you have a patient that has a one centimeter tumor, clinically occult breast cancer, and you have to do a, uh, a patient opted for a mastectomy, you can, you, you'll be okay if, uh, not to be seen by a radiation oncologist or a radiation oncology consultation will not be needed, depending on final pathology. Now, reconstruction is nowadays very commonly performed during or after mastectomy. Um, by law, every patient that undergoes breast cancer care uh, has to have a discussion of reconstruction and has to have a, uh, it doesn't matter what insurance, uh, it should be available for breast cancer patients. And reconstruction can be done, as I said, immediately, what we call immediate reconstruction, or it can be done after the mastectomy, what we call delayed reconstruction. And reconstruction can be done through a skin sparing mastectomy, which we preserve most of the skin so the nipple areola complex is removed, or sometimes we do a skin sparing, nipple sparing mastectomy. That, mean, that means that we preserve the nipple areola complex and the skin of these patients. Something that is also very common that you're going to hear in the clinics is about oncotype diagnosis. This is mainly done after surgery, uh, once pathology is available. And this is a 21 gene assay that they look at also on the mRNA on specific genes. Uh, mainly 16 genes related to estrogen, progesterone, to proliferation and metastatic potential, and it will give you a score. This is not a gene study for, of the patient. This is a gene study of the tumor, and this is very important to tell the patient. And then they will give us a result uh, if it's low, intermediate, or high. Now, who will get a 21-gene assay oncotype diagnosis? It will be patients with ER-positive tumors and most likely n no negative. And if the patient comes with a low risk, less than 18, these patients don't go through chemotherapy. In the past, every patient more than a centimeter uh, breast cancer will get chemotherapy. Now we can tell who really will benefit and who will not. Those who have and the, and the high risk will be the green. They are at higher risk of metastatic disease. Therefore, any patient with oncotype DX with a higher risk of more than 30 in the score, we know is going to get chemotherapy. We don't know what to do with intermediate risk. There are randomized trials right now. Uh, trying to find out what to do with them, but sometimes this discussion is done with the patient and they will opt for chemotherapy. So oncotype diagnosis is something very important. When you follow these patients, uh, patients go through surgery, pathology is done, they go to see the, the, the medical oncologist for decision making of chemotherapy, and there's still the 21 gene assay takes around two weeks post-surgery, post-pathology, it needs to be present to make that decision. Um, <clears throat> Finally, we go to surveillance. Uh, how do we follow up this patient? Is there, there's no clear-cut uh, evidence how to do it. NCC and guidelines will say uh, a few recommendations that I'm going to talk about. But patients are followed by the medical oncologist, radiation oncology, if radiation was done, 
and the surgical oncology is very close in treatment and then every six months. So for instance, for me as a surgeon, I like to see my patients two times prior to surgery, then I'm seeing them in a week, two weeks, six weeks, then three months, and then every six months. Why do we need to have a, a keep close an eye even though um, by, by doing a physical exam? Because most recurrences will occur if it's ERPR negative in the first two years, if they are ERPR positive, a, up, up to eight years after diagnosis. That's when we'll see these recurrences. I like to follow my patients for life. When it comes to imaging, it's also depending on, on stage and depending on type of surgery. If the patient went in mastectomy, there's no need to do more mammograms. If the patient had a lumpectomy, then six months post-radiation, we'll get a mammogram, and then every six months for the first two or three years, and then every year. Also, if the patient has nodal disease, the patient has locally adventurous cancer, then CT scan, chest odontologist could be done also for surveillance every six months or every year for the first years. So that's how we do surveillance uh, on these patients, and that's where the patient navigator is very important to follow up on these appointments with the medi medical oncology, surgical oncology, to follow up with mammograms, and to follow up with the uh, 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 also to with the self breast uh, physical exam. Finally, it's good to know about breast cancer prognosis, to have a, 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 an idea or, or what you're going to be dealing with with these patients. If the patient stage is zero, that means carcinoma in situ, the five-year survival rate is 93 percent. You may say, how come? Because most likely an invasive component was missed. That's why some patients die of, of, of um, DCIS, uh, but the majority have an excellent prognosis. We can see a stage one, 88 percent. That will be patients with a tumors less than two centimeters with no negative, with no metastatic disease to the lymph nodes. And we go to stage four, which is 15 percent. The majority of the patient will be stage one, stage two, and maybe stage uh, 2A and 2B. And we can see the prognosis is from 74 to 88 percent. We can see that stage 3B has a um, worse prognosis than stage 3C for reasons that, that uh, we don't know, but uh, the stage 3C mainly involves lymph node metastasis to the supraclavicular region, while the stage 3B uh, most of the time presents locally advanced breast cancers. Very good. Any questions? Any preguntas? Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santillan. I'm going to go ahead and open up everyone's line so that... Uh, um, no, no, one, no one heard me. Okay. No, everyone heard you. <laughs> At this time, if there are any questions or comments, feel free to go ahead and raise your virtual hand, send in a text, and I will present to Dr. Santillon. But I believe all of our uh, attendees do have computer mics. Uh, Amanda, Carmen, Guadalupe, you guys, your lines are open if you'd uh, like to ask a question. Sandra, go ahead. This is Sandra. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, Dr. Santillan. Um, our patient navigators will be primarily working with uh, Hispanic women. Clinic. What is it that we need to do in order to prevent these ladies from coming in so late with such advanced disease? Is, is it myths? Is it fear? Is it lack of health insurance? What is it that is keeping these ladies from coming in to see, um, get medical, prompt medical attention? Lack of medical, uh, lack of insurance, um, low education level, mm -hmm. poor socioeconomic status. That will be the main uh, reason. Also, fear. Um, many don't speak English, mm -hmm. and they don't know where to go, who to talk. But I will, see, I will say all a combination of all of them. Most of these patients don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And by the time they go and, if, for instance, here in San Antonio, they get into the what we call the curling system, which is the um, insurance given by the uh, county. Uh, it may take time. And, um, and they just wait, and that's how they present. Mm -hmm. Are you are you seeing any myths or hearing any myths from the women that you treat? Yeah, so uh, um, you know, one of the of the of the common myths is that that patients think that by operating the tumor, the cancer will spread. 
Yeah. And uh, that would be one. The other one would be that patients, um, they take uh, herbals or uña de gato and things like that. Yeah. And they, and that it's uh, all they need uh, to take care of the cancer or to take care of the mass. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's that's one of the other myths. Um, but in reality, it's education and it's uh, uh, low socioeconomic status that uh, yeah. they don't allow them to go see the, the primary care physician. Yeah. And now we're also seeing a trend of uh, young women getting diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, is, is there a reason why this is happening? Is it just a, a coincidence that this is happening? Do you have any insights on this? No. You know, the, in reality, what it is is... Um, Breast cancer among young women, it's actually still rare. It represents mainly uh, less than 10, 15 percent of all breast cancer. The mean age or the median age of diagnosis is 55 to 65. So uh, uh, it is hard to, to me to say without, um, because my practice is mainly young patients. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to, to say that I see, because I see more, now we have more. It is just the, 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 the selection bias. I mean, I, I get to see many of them. But in reality, the majority of the bulk of our clinic continues to be uh, uh, postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may be that young women have breast cancer and the impact in the community may be higher and the impact through internet and blogs and through news, news to, to make it sound like it's more common. But yeah. it's still, it, it, it's still not, 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 not that common. Um, we we get to see these triple negative patients uh, more in Hispanic, um, more in African American, and are more common in younger patients. And there may be a racial reason why we see more uh, younger patients in Hispanics. But overall, overall, still breast cancer the most common. It's uh, postmenopausal. I was just going to ask you about that triple negative, the vasal-like and the HER2 positive, which is more prevalent uh, among Hispanics and African Americans. Um, as you mentioned, there may be a genetic uh, factor or a racial factor. Um, is, has this been scientifically investigated? No. I mean, there's plenty of data, uh, epidemiological data, from um, the Four Corners study and from the California Cancer Registry and that the that African American and Hispanics have more uh, triple negatives and also HER2. The, the, uh, it's a biological difference it, rather than a, a cause effect. It may be uh, some genes, I don't know, that make through, uh, them to be more prone to this type of cancer, but it's not like a, 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 a ideology that we, we know at this time. We just found that if you go and get a, a, a epidemiology study with thousands of patients like the California Cancer Registry, we have close to 60,000 patients. We see that Hispanics and African Americans tend to have uh, more aggressive tumors. And for many years, we didn't know is this socioeconomic. Maybe they present with advanced cancer. Maybe you know that there's a, a disparity in treatment um, and, and that we have been saying for the last 25 years. But when we looked at maybe it's the biology, maybe the tumors that they get are, are, have a poor survival, and that's what we found. But we don't know why they get to have more of these type of tumors. Did, did, uh, I, did I explain it? Yes, yes, thank you. And we're starting to hear something about a vaccine for breast cancer. Could you, um, is the CTRC involved in this, or do, do you have any? No, any? I, 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 CTRC is not involved with this. I don't think there's a vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, for breast cancer uh, that I have heard. There's, there's, this is not, uh, I, I will have to know exactly what type of vaccine. Uh, this yeah. is not ca caused by a virus. This is a uh, multifactorial. Um, we use vaccines to treat some cancers that are not viral, like melanoma, but a vaccine to prevent it? Is that, is that why I'm here or, what, or to treat it? Uh, yeah. Uh We've been, I, I heard from Guadalupe about a doctor that gave a presentation recently about a, a, a vaccine. For treatment know, or for prevention? Guadalupe, are you on the line? Let me go ahead and unmute her. Guadalupe? Guadalupe? Your line is open? 
So I, I don't think there is uh, something right now uh, for for treating or for or for uh, prevention. Okay. That I'm aware. I may. I mean, I, I I would say no. Great. And what is the best advice that you can give to our patient navigators since they're going to be um, developing a report with the patients and calling them on a frequent basis to provide navigation services and to try to orient them as much as possible. What, what is the best advice that you can give the navigators when they're out in the field? Well, speak Spanish, uh -huh. number one. And then number two is um, love your job because uh, you're helping a lot of these patients. You need literally have to hold their hands through all the treatment. And um, you have to put yourself in the position where they on their needs and um, and help them be with them be always available for them and uh, that would be the, the best advice uh, be always with them be available for them um, if they have questions be always responsive be, be always available for them thank you Tanner and Dr. Santillan we do have let's see uh, Guadalupe and Amanda I have you guys unmuted uh, Guadalupe is here in my office <laughs> okay <laughs> Very good. And now, Carmen, you had some comments? Um, this is Guadalupe. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, what Sandra was mentioning is about um, it's doctor people from the, um, the uh, from Nancy. And this, um, he's going to start a, a study uh, for patients that have finished their treatment, so I don't know how they will, um, if it's prevention or, or recurrence. Well, if they, finish, if they finish their treatment, I mean, it's, that is for treatment, so it's not for, for prevention of cancer. So it's not a vaccine so, that you will give the patient to, to the population to prevent them with breast cancer. So there so are vaccines, there are vac these, are, these are vaccines as adjuvant therapy, experimental to see if they lower the risk of the cancer to return. Yes. Oh, okay which we do it for melanoma, it's immunotherapy, that's what we do. So you, you find um, some of the antigens uh, specific for the type of breast cancer they have, and they create these vaccines, and they put it back to the patient, so your body, your immune system fights for that particular uh, protein, and that will fight the breast, the, the cancer. But, so it's for treatment, it's not for prevention. Okay. Are there any additional there comments or questions at this time? I did get a comment from Carmen that said, thank you so much for the presentation. Very helpful visuals. Great. Un placer. Pues, pues muchas gracias. Estamos muy agradecidas, Alfredo. No, no, no. Lo que necesiten. No sé si necesitan cualquier otra cosa, me avisan. Con mucho gusto ayudo. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Susie. This was, was a wonderful presentation, as usual. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Santillan and the rest okay. of the REDIS members for taking time out of your schedule to join us for today's webinar. From everyone here at the University of Texas Health Science Center and the Teleconference Network of Texas team, thank you for your participation and have a wonderful day.